second table we switch the chair. <laughs> the chair. Yeah. And, uh, yes. I will talk about child poverty, uh, the family and the state, which means I'm going to talk about child poverty and um, I think two important players, the child poverty, the one the family and the other one is the state. I think this is obvious that families influence in child poverty and also it's obvious that the state, the governmental institutions or public institutions and organizations also influence child poverty and also taxation and social policy. In this manner, I will not say much about I will say nothing about taxation, and I will not say much about social policy. Um, but maybe we can discuss some issues in the discussion then. Yes, uh, I will start with child poverty. I'm a philosopher, a philosopher, and so I'm asking a question, why is child poverty of interest for philosophy? Um, because most people think of child poverty as an interest, is an issue of interest for the social sciences, sciences and maybe also for politics, uh, surely for social policy, but not for philosophy and the philosophical literature and child poverty is non-existent. There's nearly no book or even article treating child poverty as an issue of its own from a strictly philosophical um, perspective or approach. So, child poverty has not received any significant attention in philosophy, I would say that. Poverty is getting a lot of attention in philosophy nowadays. This started in the 70s, 80s, and now there are some very big names, I would like to say, like Thomas Powell or a singer a little bit older, or to David Miller, or Hill Steiner, or Paolo Casale, or other people thinking about especially global poverty and uh, theories of justice, or, um, global ethics, and uh, these issues. And for sure, if someone thinks about global poverty, child poverty is part of the problem because uh, their children are affected by global poverty. Many children, I fear just one figure, millions of children each year die because they're living in poverty and don't have access to adequate health care or medical care and so on and so forth. But the peculiarity and the distinctiveness of child poverty is not a topic in philosophy. Philosophy does not um, elaborate such questions as What's the difference between child poverty and adult poverty? What's the significance of um, child poverty in very developed countries and in, in developing countries? Or why do we have um, different... Uh, why uh, in nearly all countries in this world more children are poor than adults? But even if it is the case that child poverty is not a topic in current philosophy, I think it's obvious that child poverty bears a lot of normative and um, philosophical um, questions, and that a normative perspective, a perspective from social justice or justice in general, is important when we talk about child poverty. It's, I think, it's kind of common sense that people say that child poverty is bad or morally wrong and that child poverty should not be and that we should uh, do what we can to eradicate child poverty in this world and that um, we should help these um, billions of children living in poverty nowadays. And as I already said, scope and depth of child poverty is really alarming today. It is uh, one of the most pressing and urgent concerns, I think, of today's world, is child poverty. 
Uh, we are just a few figures. Um, in the European Union, 27% of children under 18 live in poverty. In the United States, 22% of children under 18 live in poor households. Um, globally, every second child lives in poverty and as I already said, 6.9 million children die each year before they reach their fifth birthday. And I think these figures alone show that child poverty is a problem, not only in Africa or India, but it's also a problem in Austria and in the United States. And and the current economic crisis, um, yeah, I will call it just the current crisis that's uh, um, going on since five or four years maybe in, in, in Europe, has a significant impact also on child poverty. Because children, poor children, are dependent on on social services, on, on all these public institutions and these and a lot of public institutions um, came under a lot of pressure during the crisis because of austerity measures and so on and so forth. And also if, um, if adults lose their job, this also always merely directly affects the children living in those households. So, the first kind of topic I want to talk about is uh, what is child poverty? There are so many different approaches to child poverty nowadays that uh, to try to answer the question what is unjust about child poverty um, depends on saying what I or what the person who tries to answer this question understands when we talk about uh, child poverty. So child poverty can be approached from many different uh, theoretical and also methodological perspectives. There's so many different kinds of uh, approaches to measure child poverty in the, in the global scale or the national scale. And uh, still the monetary approaches are still dominating. This is to say, if a child lives in a poor household who has less than 60% of the median income, then this child is poor. Or if a child lives in a household um, that is less than, I don't know, $5 a day, this child is poor. Or if a child itself has an income less than $1.25 a day, then this child is poor. But monetary approaches are very difficult to apply to children because most children do not earn their own money because they live in households and these household and the adults in these households earn this money. So it is very difficult and nearly impossible to target children directly using monetary approaches in, in, in poverty research. And this is also one reason why in recent years there's a growing tendency to deploy other measures than only monetary one, multi-dimensional measures, and also measures including the subjective experience of poverty, asking children how they feel, how they live their lives, what, what they are actually able to do in their, in their free time, for example. Do they have access to playgrounds or do they have access to, to, to child um, specific goods like toys and so on and so forth? Yes. And so if I talk about child poverty as a problem of justice, I would like to talk about child poverty in this multi dimensional and this broader um, understanding. Not only about children living in poor households, but children um, experience many different kinds of, uh, of forms of social exclusion or different kinds of deprivation, like <coughs> ill health, 
no adequate access to healthcare, no adequate access to schooling or education, um, no access to, to playgrounds or to toys, or living not in a safe environment, the neighborhood, which uh, is for children really problematic because children are not uh, able to defend themselves as adults and they then have to have to stay in the flats and um, and they're not um, allowed to, to go out and play outside and so on and so forth. So I understand child poverty and this is in line with the growing tendency in also in social and scientific approaches to child poverty as a multi-dimensional problem and multi-dimensional phenomena. So if I now apply social justice to child poverty, which I think is um, interest, not only interesting to do, but uh, which is necessary to do, because only then we can also know how we should alleviate or eradicate child poverty. So social justice, it is an essentially contested concept. I think this is also common sense. So not only in philosophy, there are different theories of social justice, but also in the, the population or in politics, there are many different understandings of social justice. We have now an election coming in Austria and all parties would say that they um, pursue uh, social justice, that they support social justice. But they mean that there are a lot of different kind of things they uh, understand uh, as social justice. And they think, and this is what I want to say when I coin it as an essential contest, the concept is that we will never reach any agreement, uh, um, even within philosophy and not on a broader scale in the population and politics, on what exactly to understand the social justice. So we will always have um, kind of discussions or disagreement about it. And as Gunther has said in his talk, the place of children in social justice is especially uh, unclear because in philosophy most theories of social justice don't uh, talk about children in particular. And also in politics, children are most often only talked about as part of, say, family policies and because children children are not um, maybe it has uh, something to do with that children are not allowed to vote themselves and so the, so children are only politics often only part of, of, of questions concerning adults and this has also a lot to do with what can social policy do actually to uh, alleviate um, child poverty, because you can't give the benefits of money directly to the children, you always have to give it to the adults, then have to give it uh, to the children or buy something for the children. So also most discussions in social policy on a, on, on a broader political level are about adults, and adults who are then responsible to do something good or bad with what they get from the state for the, for the children. I would say that the injustice of child poverty in the broadest sense has something to do with that child poverty is harmful for the child herself, that children are suffering in some way. There are many questions that are, are many question marks if we say that children suffer from child poverty, but I think this is the this is the flaw, this is the basic understanding of why child poverty is unjust, because it is bad for those children. And I think the other important dimension is that it's not only bad for the 
child or for the children who are poor, but that it has a bad influence, that it is bad in a life course perspective. And Kunze mentioned uh, the importance of this life course perspective for, for um, social justice, and I think there are not many, many social problems that show us the importance of this life course perspective as clear as child poverty. Because all the social scientific knowledge we have about child poverty is that growing up poor has bad consequences. Children, when you are poor as a child, you are much more likely to be poor as an adult. This is called the transmission or the intergenerational persistence of poverty. And this is this is just a, just a fact. So, child poverty is not only bad for the child herself, but is bad for the future adult. And I think this is the basic, um, or this is this is the most important. Um, feature of child poverty if we talk about it from a social justice perspective. That if we want a socially just society, it does not we have to tackle child poverty because it is unjust for the children themselves and also because child poverty is harmful for for the future adults. And we if we want to achieve justice for for adults, then we have to achieve justice also for children, because other, otherwise this will not be possible in any, in any way. So we have to secure not only as a, as a duty of justice the well-being or the non-poverty situation of children, but also we have, if we do so, then we are much more likely to achieve justice for, for adults. Because, as I say here, the life chances are severely influenced by growing up poor. And life chances are an important topic, an important dimension in all different um, theories of social justice. And I now want to turn to the family and then I would say something about this thing. Before that, child poverty is um, embedded in many different um, social layers or, or, and is influenced by many different um, kinds of persons and institutions and, and conditions. This is what in the literature is called the ecology of child poverty or an ecological approach to child poverty. Children in poverty, and also children not in poverty, are surrounded by various environments that shape their living condition. The family is one important, but also peers, they are the children. And this is a very delicate topic, because um, peers can have good and also very bad influence on children. Mobbing in schools, and... Uh, Poor children are more often the victims of mobbing, and also the victims of mobbing, mobbing because they are poor, and, and this can have severely harmful consequences on the, uh, on the, on the um, psychological well-being of, of, of poor children. Another uh, important environment is the school, the neighborhood, but also the labor market, laws, and uh, so and states and and so forth. But also children do themselves shape their poverty conditions. And children are not the, the only objects of poverty, they're not just victims, but they, they influence the situation and also they try to influence the, the poverty condition of their parents often. They try to cope for the parents and, uh, and also children develop um, different coping measures to, to, 
to cope with their own situation. I don't have um, time to elaborate this in more detail, but it's just important to say that if we talk about child poverty, we should not talk about only the one child or the millions of children that are living in poverty, but we have to talk about the whole social embedding of child poverty and also the, the structural causes of child poverty, so to say. So, who is responsible to secure social justice for children in this case, to alleviate the poverty situation of the child and to secure these um, life chances to develop into a an, into an, into not poor adult, so to say. Maybe this is the minimal condition, just to be not poor. I don't talk about to be a happy person or satisfied person or maybe an autonomous person, but just into a non-poor person who is responsible you know, for this. The family for sure has some responsibility because the family or the close caregivers, those few persons that are close to the children, they does not need to be the biological parents, maybe foster parents or in, in institutions, other kinds of caregivers. They shape the poverty condition of the children, so they have at least some responsibility to, to alleviate the poverty condition of the child. But the family or the close caregivers, if they are the parents or the siblings or uncles, they are often not in the position to significantly change the poverty condition because they put themselves. And because they have maybe a lot of other uh, problems that are typically associated or connected to, to being poor, such as unemployment, financial strain, ill health, various kinds of addictions and so on and so forth. So from the perspective of a theory of justice, I, I would say that the family is responsible to help the child and the children, but they are not able to do so in many cases. So we have to, and this is also important for how to design social policy or how to talk about child poverty. Because social policy then has to decide should it help the family or the parents to become not poor or to become um, healthy or to find employment, to find a good housing in order to help these children that are living with the parent. So the, it's the target problem, who do I target with the social policy measures if I want to alleviate child poverty. And if I say that or if uh, social policy is designed that it uh, says no we don't want to target the, the, the family, we want to target directly the children and help them, then what to do with all these things that um, cannot be substituted, uh, cannot be provided by the state, like love, care, emotional support, things that are very important for children and that, uh, that are often missing in households, uh, uh, in poor households, because, because the parents are ill, because the parents have so many problems themselves that they cannot um, provide proper care and support for the children. And these uh, factors, they can also be called conversion factors in the sense of the capability approach because they are important to develop capabilities and functions. So if the family is important and has certain duties of justice towards um, the children living in these families, uh, who are part of these families, so has the state. The state is on the, is, I would like to say, the other, this very important player. Because 
the state has the power to change a lot of things. If you think of the state as, as, uh, as the, all these public institutions, the design of the different policy areas, social policy, education, family policies, and so on and so forth, and economic policies also. So the state has the power to do a lot of things that shape or that change the poverty condition of children. I would like to say that the state is responsible to secure um, conditions of social justice for children and therefore to fight child poverty in some ways, at least. And the state, if it has this responsibility of social justice towards children living in poverty, then it has to think how to do so in a, in a good way. And there are also certain obstacles to secure social justice for children living in poverty, also for the state. So, like the family, the state has duties of justice, but the, these duties of justice, they are limited by or the, the, executions, uh, the execution of these duties is limited by the um, distinctive nature of child poverty also. Because, as I said, the state cannot provide love or emotional support and care for all children. It can support maybe good schooling and good housing and access to to um, enough money to buy enough toys and so on and so forth. But it, but if you think of a family where the uh, a lone mother and the lone mother gets also sick and uh, there are two, two, two underage children, and what can the state do? It can um, send social workers there, it can help try to support the mother, but it will not be able to fully substitute if the mother is no longer able to take care or to support the children. And it will also not be able to, to, to or maybe it will not be able to, to give these two children the same life chances as two children growing up in a, in a rich and loving family have. Yes, I was already talked about the target problem that the state has, if it should support the young children or the caregivers, and how to intervene in, in such instances when it is best to support the family or the caregivers, the parents or the parent, and if they don't use this support to support young children. If you give money to, 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 to the parents and the parents use the money for their own addiction, for example. And uh, there, are many, there are many cases of child neglect that happen in, 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 in poor families. So there are, and this is the last point I want to make, a lot of not only possible tensions, but there are actually tensions between the autonomy of the family and the state. If we say that we know that parents not always know best for the children, and they also not always act in the best interest of, the, of their children. I think this is obviously often the case. But it is very difficult for the state to determine when it has the right to intervene. If, uh, if you grow up, for example, in Austria, in a low-income family, and uh, the father works as a construction worker, and he says, no, I don't want my son to, to pursue an academic career. I don't want him to go to, to high school or to university, but I want him to become a construction worker like myself. I want him to stay in a low-income social class, so to say. And doesn't all the state 
has any obligation to intervene here to say no. You should um, help your son to pursue an, another career so that he maybe someday in, in the, the position to earn more money, to become a middle-income um, citizen and to give his own children better education, better health care maybe. This is not so much a problem in Austria, but in, I think in the United States where there's no, no, no health insurance uh, for millions of people, these problems become obvious. And this is also poor, this is also the case in, in, in poor families, because the poverty situation is not only about money or the income of the family, but there's also cultural influences and uh, other different forms of influences and it maybe is easier, it is easy for the state to give some money to the family, but it's much more complicated to change um, patterns of behavior, cultural uh, cultural patterns that are also maybe closely connected to the poverty condition or why a child, a poor child develops into a poor um, adult. This is also some call it in the literature with uh, if you grow up in a family where the parents do not work but live from benefits, those children are also more likely to become unemployed themselves as an adult. Be maybe also because uh, this uh, different kind of, of, of attitude or relation to work and labor itself is part of, of the childhood. Because the child learns that it's, it's not necessary to work or maybe it's not even good to work or that it does not have a chance at all to, to, to find work. And this can convert it. This has for sure an influence on how the child itself or when it becomes older and adult, how the adult then understands herself and, and if it uh, seeks work uh, or not. So I would like to end my talk now because we talked way too long and I also